Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Carmine Bailey, Vince Power, Rodrigo Smith Zapata, and three new patrons that we got since yesterday's show, Molly, Douglas, and Roz. Welcome, new patrons. On this episode of DTNS, a non-Apple VR expert weighs in on the Vision Pro. Google continues to pull away from search, but at what cost? And let's talk about a U.S. TikTok ban. Is that actually happening? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, March 14th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chain. We have got a jam-packed show for everyone. And if you're eating a tamale while you're listening to the show at any hour of the day, no matter where you are, we consider that a plus. Uh, if not, well, you know, maybe next time. All right, let's start with the quick hits. Microsoft's new single version of Teams for both work and personal accounts is currently in testing, letting users switch between multiple tenants and personal or work account types. It's due to be rolled out to commercial users in April and will include an account switcher accessible from the profile section. In a blog post, Microsoft said users consistently prefer a single team app that allows you to easily access and switch between personal and work accounts. Proton, the privacy-focused mail calendar, online storage, and password manager, announced today that its desktop mail app for Windows and Mac OS is out of beta and now available to all of its paid users. Proton is releasing its Linux app in beta. If you don't currently pay for Proton Mail, you can try it out for two weeks. Otherwise, the Mail Plus plan costs $4 a month if you sign up for a year. Proton Unlimited is $10 per month with a year plan that includes 500 gigabytes of storage, Proton Drive, Pass, and VPN. OpenAI CTO Mira Marotti says that the company's text-to-video generator called Sora, S-O-R-A, will be available as soon as a few months from now and is gearing up to incorporate sound as well. Sora is currently capable of generating hyper-realistic scenes based on a text prompt, which was first shown off in February. When the Wall Street Journal asked Marotti what data is used to train Sora, she said... I'm not going to go into the details of the data that was used, but it was publicly available or licensed data. Marathi also said she isn't sure if Sora uses videos from YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram, but she did confirm that Sora does use content from Shutterstock, which OpenAI has a partnership with. Meta announced it will shutter its journalism tool, CrowdTangle, used by academics to study the flow of content on Facebook and Instagram, including in conspiracy theories and fake news. Meta's new content library tool will replace CrowdTangle, but will be limited to academics and nonprofit researchers. Meta claims that content library is a tool built in response to the European Union's Digital Markets Act, but appears to be a watered down version of CrowdTangle, but one that for profit news organizations cannot use. Hmm. Hmm. Amazon is releasing a new generative AI feature to let sellers make product pages by copy pasting a link with information about that product from another site. The goal, you know, if you're Amazon of the AI generated product is to complete uh, written descriptions, images, help sellers reduce the time it takes to bring that product over into Amazon's marketplace from wherever it was before. Sellers must be the owner or the rights holder or have the license to use those links contents. Otherwise, Amazon might take legal action if it finds that the seller misrepresented their ownership of the website. Pretty cut and dry here. The feature is rolling out now and will be available to U.S. sellers in the coming weeks. All right, Rob, let's talk about how people uh, feel about the Vision Pro uh, about a month in now. Absolutely. So so Hugo, Hugo Barra, former VP of Android and head of Meta's phased out Oculus headset brand, has some thoughts about Apple's Vision Pro, liking in it to an over-engineered dev kit that ships with more sensors than is necessary to deliver Apple's intended experience. Barr oversaw the Oculus team in 2017 after it was acquired by Facebook. He notes that while the Vision Pro is an impressive device with six tracking cameras, two pass-through cameras, two def sensors, and four eye tracking cameras, it's over-specking and characteristic of a V1 product where its creator wants to ensure that it survives the hardest test early users will no doubt want to put the product through. Now, 
Uh, if you, <laughs> myself included, because I got one behind me uh, in the next room, almost nobody thinks that the Vision Pro version one is going to be the final product. For example, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman reports that Apple is working on multiple new Apple Vision models, exploring both a lower cost version, that would be uh, obviously a treat for some people because $3,500 is a real, uh, a real price barrier for a lot of folks. Also a second gen version, uh, a lower cost version um, could eliminate something like the EyeSight feature or the M series chip using more affordable components that maybe people are okay with, which kind of speaks to Barra saying they went overboard with this. You know, there are specs in here that are very, uh, you know, it, you know, impressive, but are they really working for the consumer? Well, again, whether it's a developer or a consumer product is a subject of much, much debate. But Vara also thinks that Apple has made the Vision Pro experience intentionally blurry in order to hide pixelation artifacts and make graphics appear smoother. He says that's a clever move, but the design decision made significant motion blur and image quality issues that render pass-through mode unusable for longer periods. Now, Justin, some mm -hmm. folks say, love love the pro, you know, lo love the experience. It's heavy. You know, it's it's maybe too much for me. I think that's what uh, the, that that's what Barra is going for here. But um, wh wh where do you land on the whole, you know, Vision One being too good out of the gate? Well, uh, speaking as somebody, and it will caveat that I have not used the Vision Pro. However, I have certainly ingested as many opinions about it, not only from professionals, but also friends of mine that have purchased it. Uh, and it appears that it is a minimum viable product for what Apple wants in this space. And that is demonstrating that they can bring this uh, level of experience to a best in class place that nobody has been able to touch thus far. That being said, I do think that the the opinions of, of, of Mr. Barra here are pretty head on. Uh, specifically, I, I would say that there are design decisions that are made in here that are a little puzzling as soon as they decided to have the battery be an external uh device uh connected of course by a supple woven cable still one of my funniest appleisms of all time uh <laughs> that they should have put some of the compute on there they should have taken some kind of weight off that headset because that no matter what have the best experience you can possibly have the average person can only really have about a half hour's worth of it at max because it begins to wear on your head. And if what they want you to do is have these very immersive, lengthy experiences, watch a whole uh, sports game, watch a whole movie, do uh, uh, work with it for uh, you know a nine to five job, or at least as much as you'd be looking at your MacBook, that headset needs to be lighter. And until that happens, until you can uh, seriously expect people to wear it for three plus hours, then I have a hard time believing someone's going to drop 3K on the next version. Well, it. and they're lucky to wear it for three plus hours with the battery life um, as it is anyway. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I, I, you know, I, I have been trying out the vision pro in a variety of scenarios, you know, because I care and also because uh, I'm also doing Apple Vision Show with Eileen Rivera. Uh, we record live on Mondays. Please check it out. But uh, but it's not that heavy. However, I am also used to wearing a Quest. I had the Quest 1, the Quest 2. I've got the Quest Pro. The Vision Pro is heavier. It's not significantly heavier on my face. Your mileage may vary, of course. Um, I think that's why Apple went through, you know, all these leaps and bounds to figure out, you know, how it attaches to your head, go into an Apple store, have somebody, you know, help, you know, make sure that you get, the, you know, the, the right strap for your face. The battery pack is where I just am like, you're kidding me. You know, at this point... Can we not just have something that doesn't have to, you know, the battery pack itself is, I mean, it's like a big brick. I mean, it's not yeah. a huge brick. I mean, you can put it in a pocket, but like not with like everything that you're wearing. It's a, it's, it's asking a lot. I mean, yes, you're not tethered to a PC. That would be worse. But to be tethered to a large battery pack when you have other headsets that don't need that um, and have like pretty decent battery life. That's a tough sell. 
Rob, where, where are you on this? So I actually got to play with a Vision Pro for about 15 minutes, about a week, week and a half ago. A buddy of mine who actually is a developer in his company got one to work on. Uh, I happened to be, had it at home and I went over his house and, you know, put it on. So the first thing you, you notice is what everyone has said. It is really heavy. But one of the things he said to me was that, so it's, it's what he thought the device would be. He thought that Apple would put out a version one device, put everything in the world in it, and then give it to people like him and his company to figure out what to do with it, report back to Apple, here's the changes that you need to make. Um, and when I think back to what Apple said initially about the device, that kind of lines up, you know, that, you know, they, they see this as a version 1.0 and something else will come later. So, uh, you know, even though I don't have one, I'm not terribly upset with it, but it is really heavy. And one of the things that he told me in order for him to wear it for more than half hour, 45 minutes at a time, he literally has to like lay or lean back on a couch where he just has something that's supporting his head to take the pressure off of his neck. So that is absolutely something that Apple's going to have to address. Indeed. Um, you know, t Tom uh, Merritt asked me the other day, like, what are you using it for the most? You know, just, you know, in the early days. And I said, media consumption. Um, I do not uh, consume uh, the Oscars uh, standing in, uh, you know, in the middle of my living room. I'm on my couch, got a pillow behind me. It's yeah. all good. If I were to be standing or walking around, that would be very different. And I think a lot of people are sort of like, but the use case is supposed to be that we can walk around, you know, or stand or, you know, go about life. AR, right? Um, and, you know, people are finding that that's still pretty, pretty difficult. I got, an, I got a solution. $300 Apple branded neck braces. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. And, and like in a variety of colors, right? Sure. Matt Do a Hermes Black. one, you know, <laughs> you know, if somebody wants to be fancy, we're fine. So guys, let's change gears a little bit and let's let's talk about search because search as we know it is changing and it's being changed by generative AI that first entered into our lexicon when ChatGBT launched back on November 30th of 2022. Not even a year and a half later, however, AI is everywhere. Google launched its artificial intelligence powered search engine or search generative experience in beta last May, sending publishers scrambling to prepare for significant disruption in organic search traffic with potential declines ranging from 20 to 60 percent, according to experts. Mark McCollum, executive vice president of innovation at Raptive, estimates that with the current SGE and it's only going to get better Ad revenue loss could amount to as much as two billion annually across the publishing industry. So, Justin, the, the bulk of Google's revenue comes from search. So, is it safe to assume that Google won't eat its own lunch with the coming sea change from search to SGE? Well, you know, what do you think? Is is, is Google going to survive this? And more importantly, will the advertisers survive this? To say that Google makes the bulk of its money on advertising is like saying that the bulk of your driving is fueled by gasoline. <laughs> like it is what yeah, Google we'll, does. We'll tell that to the EV users, but yes, sure, we, yes, we get exactly. we, we we get the comparison. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 they are an ad sales company, and they have been an ad sales company from the moment that they realized that they had a one hundred percent margin product uh, that they could sell as many times as they wanted. It is has totally cornered the market and reshaped the concept of advertising. Google has revolutionized this space. So, yes, they do need to understand that what they do in pivoting away from that, anything that will take down their search uh, activity takes down their ability to sell these ads, which makes them less money. They need to understand that that was decaying anyway, and this this – uh, sea change is happening. They can't be without a boat. So, yes, they need to be concerned, and they hope that they are going to be able to make up for this revenue, that they will be surviving in the future when search revenue is not what it was anyway, regardless of whether or not they're in the game, uh, that they need to be into the membership world and the API world, specifically both with their, with their LLM. What I would say is what about their current world of rolling out their LLMs makes us think that they will be competent in that phase of it? Because they certainly haven't been competent in uh, the rollout, despite the fact that they have nothing but data, nothing but talent, and nothing but money. They should be 
a leading player, if not the leading player, and they have made unforced error after unforced error. I mean, call me naive, um, and I very much am sometimes uh, when it comes to you know what Google is doing behind the scenes with search. But if, okay, let's say, you know, the old way of doing things is I type in orange cat into Google search, and mm-hmm. Google search, you know, gives me the results that it thinks I'm probably looking for. And there are sponsored results as well, you know, and I might click on one of those and somebody makes some money as a result. Uh, With AI search, uh, you know, the the idea is that the whole whole model is better trained to understand what I was going for initially, but that doesn't stop advertisers from still saying, hey, this is an interesting topic that you might like more of. I don't know. I don't know that advertisers are 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 screwed over in the sense, you know. And may, and and maybe I maybe I'm not getting it, but I feel like if you can, uh, I don't know, uh, you know, make sure that you're you're changing with the times. Um, and I know not every advertiser has uh, a. a um, a, a really great relationship with Google, you know, to to know exactly what to do. But this feels like just more of the same to me. So I, I think one of the issues is that the 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 scenario that you that you lay out, you go to your search engine, you search for something, and then you get results, and you start clicking links, yeah. and many of those results could be paid. So every time you click that link. The advertiser is paying a little bit of money to have you click it. Google is making a little money because you have clicked it. The change now with these, uh, you know, with these chat bots, basically, is that you type in your question and it just delivers the answer. There's really nothing for you to click on. So I would hope that Google is working on something that in that interface, there are going to be clickable links or there's going to be ads that you can click on where they will ultimately be able to continue to generate revenue. And there will also be a place for uh, advertisers to get traffic to their actual website instead of, you know, instead of just getting the answer, I want to go ahead and click on and go through to the gap. I want to click on and go through to the GM dealership. I want to click on and go on through to the, 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 you know, the cell phone manufacturer um, yeah. that I was interested in. Um, and I think that that's what Google absolutely has to get right. And to Justin's point, there's nothing that they've been doing in this realm that makes me think that they're going to be any better at that than they are with what they have been already. So it's concerning. I guess uh, it, it, there's a lot that has to do with what you're searching for, right? Like, yeah, if you're like, call the car dealership, I need to take my car in on Saturday. When do they have appointments type thing? It's like, well, well it, you know, what's search going to do for you? Sarah, like you also have to understand how this process works in terms of how you buy advertising. You buy AdWords. Literally, you are typing in what you are selling. Uh, uh, and what you are, sorry, what you are searching for, what people are searching for and what your ad is going to be against it. So for example, Weezer just announced a tour. I'm a huge Weezer fan because I'm a man of a certain age and I uh, uh, really want tickets for when they come to Austin. I'm searching Weezer tour Austin and ticket resellers are going to have on, uh, uh, they're going to buy tickets or buy the the, uh, uh, search words for Weezer tour Austin. It's an understood and incredibly lucrative and powerful relationship between anybody off the street who wants to buy ads and the biggest place where people spend time and are actively searching for something. You've taken that away when it comes to these LLMs because you're typing in a block of text or maybe you're asking it to summarize something. There's a billion different uses for it. And so you've diluted the the point in which you know somebody is looking for something and it's not as easy for you to know exactly what you are going to find or how you're going to get in front of the person that you need to get in front of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you sell the thing you want to sell to that person? Exactly. When, when they, they don't really need you anymore. I'm going to that tour, by the way. It's going to be great. Oh, I'm jealous. Love Weezer. Yeah. The Blue Album, whole way. It's going to be awesome. Well, folks, have a thought about something on the show, but don't know our email address? Here it is. Email us at feedback.dailytechnewsshow.com. 
All right. Yesterday in our quick hits, we reported that a bipartisan bill uh, compelling ByteDance to sell TikTok passed the U.S. House of Representatives on Wednesday. The bill still needs to clear the Senate. If it does, President Biden said last Friday he would sign the bill into law. But we knew Justin was going to be on the show today. So we kept the conversation to right now. Uh, what's fun uh, is that there are other details <laughs> since we last talked about this. Former U.S. Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin now says he's putting together a consortium to try to buy TikTok, adding there is no way that the Chinese government would ever let a U.S. company own something like this in China. He added, this is something that should be owned by U.S. businesses. Now, Justin, a lot of things, a uh, lot, lot, lot of balls in the air here. Uh, yes. D- first... Does this bill get passed through the Senate? And if it doesn't, does the idea of forcing the sale of TikTok have any legs anymore? Okay, so if we're going to start at the Senate, I'm upgrading it from maybe to maybe. That's the official diagnosis on whether okay. or not it's going to get yeah. passed through the Senate. But sort, of let's- a, sort of a 50-50? Uh, yeah, yeah. It went from, from a little bit like 60, 40. Now we're at 50, 50 and it's changing very, very quickly, but let's take a step back and really just walk through this because I think a lot of people might be confusing. Uh, it is a confusing situation compared to the peril that TikTok has been in the past. So back toward the end of the Trump administration, there was executive actions looking to have TikTok's either divest from its parent company, ByteDance, or to move its data to an American provider. That happened, and uh, TikTok started working through a subsidiary to store all of their American data with Oracle. It's called Project Texas. If you have followed any of this, it's what the CEO of TikTok consistently refers to whenever he is uh, uh, talking with people from the Senate or the House because that was supposed to settle this. What this bill says is that TikTok must be divested from ByteDance. And if they don't divest from ByteDance, they will be essentially banned from the internet by way of delisting from app stores and internet service providers not being able to process their traffic and Oracle not being able to work with them in terms of hosting their data. Mm -hmm. What happened earlier this week uh, after a... Uh, a meeting with the members of the house and the intelligence community, wherein reportedly there was a presentation showing that there are algorithmic boosts to stories and issues that divide America. And specifically the issue that was reportedly shown to them with enough evidence to get everybody moving in the same direction at the same time was the, uh, the Israel Hamas situation past October 7th was something that was algorithmically boosted beyond what it would normally be if it were just regular traffic. This according to reports. That gets this bill flying through the House. And what you need to understand if you don't follow politics is that this has been a very, very, very partisan body specifically over the last two years. There's not a lot at all that the Republicans and the Democrats agree on. Heck, Mm -hmm. there's not a lot that Democrats and Democrats agree on or Republicans and Republicans agree on in the House. This exploding through is notable because it doesn't really happen. It wasn't unanimous, but considering how fractious they've been, it was something to keep an eye on. So now it goes to the Senate. The Senate needs to pass by 60 votes. The Democrats have a one or the, the, the Democrats have control of the chamber. That means that essentially this bill is now in Democratic hands. The president of the United States, who is also a Democrat, has said, put this bill on my desk and I'll sign it. Normally, if you have a lot of momentum for a bill out of the House and the president says, pass this bill, give me this bill, I'll sign it. Sort of assumes that, yeah, it's going to go. That would happen. So the fact that it has not is notable. And the fact that Chuck Schumer, the speaker of that, or sorry, the uh, uh, the Senate Majority Leader, has not moved it forward, considering he's been a huge China hawk for a very, very long time, longer than than our our modern understanding of it is. He's always been very, uh, very aggressive toward China. He has not moved this forward. S- makes me think something is being 
something is coming up the works. And whether it be that the White House doesn't actually want to sign this, but they want to say they 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 sign it, uh, whether or not there are elements of the Senate, which is very distrustful of the House, and they might not like this bill, so they want to rewrite their own bill and uh, go through the process of reconciling that with the House's bill. All of this is in motion right now. But what is for sure is we've never been closer to TikTok being banned in America than we are right now. Justin, you said last week when we talked about this that, um, you know, what does ByteDance do at this point? Because they actually put out a, a plea to its users yeah. on, you know, on the platform where it's like, hey, contact yeah. your, your congressperson. congressperson. <laughs> Let them know that, you know, that this is about to go down. And people reacted. So w- one of the things that I would say maybe that is working in ByteDance's favor is that they have upset pretty much everybody on TikTok. Now, here's the thing. People are upset for the wrong reason. I, I don't think that a lot of people understand why the United States is thinking about uh, pulling this out of China. They're trying to make comparisons to what is happening with Facebook or what happens on Instagram and things like that. And this really has nothing to do with that. This has everything to do with that. We really are not feeling China right now as uh, you know, you know, government to government. And we know that they wouldn't let us run this app there. Uh, we don't want that app running here, particularly with all the data that, uh, you know, that, that you know, that, that potentially it's supposed to be going through project tests, but potentially all the data that could be going right into Beijing. So th- th- that is really a problem for the United States. And I can't call it. Um, it looks like the CEO of ByteDance is like, all right, let's 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 go ahead and pump some money into um, lobbying right fast and see if mm-hmm. we can't get folks that are right now in Congress that are particularly in the Senate to hold up and say, well, what about this? And what about that? And, and money often tends to do those things. So it's going to be a really interesting. Well, and there uh, are you know, members of Congress who are dance because who, was that there? Uh, there are members of Congress who have been, you know, very vocal, like this is not a good idea. You know, not that it isn't a good idea, but like this particular bill is not a good idea. It's rushed. It's, you know, it's not in the great interest of, you know, the American people, et cetera, et cetera, Um, which, you know, also lends to a lot of confusion, especially when something is a, you know, nonpartisan, as you mentioned, Justin, bill fairly across the board. Yeah. So uh, a few things. Number one, uh, uh, the great and powerful Tom Merritt was on my program, Politics, 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 on Wednesday discussing this exact issue before the vote came through in the House. And he made a point that I very much agree with. I think this is less about data than it is about culture. Because if we were worried about Chinese-owned companies that have massive install bases on American phones that have permission to all the same things that TikTok asked permission for, then we'd be banning a lot of mobile games that are not currently at issue right now. Mm -hmm. What is at issue is culture. And the fact that an algorithm that is programmed on in, in that has ties to mainland China and mainland China has said will not be licensed or sold. That's something that happened during the first push here, that that algorithm is a outsized part of our current culture. The, the fact that that, is, that that is happening is really what has made this a code red situation for Congress, in my opinion. Well, uh, I have a feeling that this story will not end anytime soon. Um, we will definitely see what happens in the Senate uh, with ByteDance slash TikTok. Um, but... Thank you, Justin, for getting us up to speed on where we are at this point. And let folks know where they can keep up with other political stuff that you follow when you're not with us. Well, if you want to listen to that conversation with Tom, then you can go ahead and do that on uh, Politics, Politics, Politics. It was our Wednesday episode. Did Donald Trump and Marjorie Taylor Greene save TikTok? Because, by the way, it's another funny element of this is that it has united disparate interests like Vivek Ramaswamy, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Donald Trump, and the squad. Look at that strange bedfellows. So thanks to you, Justin Robert Young, and thanks to our patrons who should stick around for the extended show. Good day, Internet. The right to repair is gaining steam. We will talk about the latest advances in the U.S. and what that means for manufacturers. 
Just a reminder, we do the show live, and you can catch it live Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Thanks to everybody who's with us every day. We're back doing it all again tomorrow. Stay with us. The DTNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>